Christina, for the, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today and to present my research and my work to you. Um, my topic is mostly related on cellulose chemistry and I'm trying to overcome current limitations. So on one hand, I'm trying to introduce a new type of nanocellulose, um, which kind of broaden the range of applications, um, optimizing currently used chemical reactions, but also um, introducing new tools, which are really designed especially for cellulose. Um, but first I would like to start with my motivation a bit. So why am I working with cellulose? And let's see. Yes, okay, it's working. Um, so in principle, we all know this, we read it in many reviews, um, cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer. And it's literally true. If you look out of a window, we can see plants, trees, and the main structural polymer is cellulose. And the reason, and that's the reason why these plants are so strong. And if we compare now the mechanical performance of the cellulose crystal, for example, to biopolymers like dragon silk or man-made materials like glass fibers, nylon, steel, we can see that cellulose outperforms them. Of course, we are here seeing the properties of a crystal. So still it's, a, it's challenging to kind of scale these properties into a material, but I think we are on a good track here. Um, and furthermore, cellulose on itself has intrinsic functionality. For example, we can use cellulose nanocrystals to produce coatings with structural color. We can as well use cellulose nanofibers to produce hydrogels and aerogels with very high specific surface area. And here we can see that, for example, with tempo oxidized nanofibers, we can reach values up to 600 square meter per gram. It just, it's of course very hard to imagine what this means, but if you imagine like we have 10 grams of this aerogel, this would represent a surface of a whole soccer field. So it's a huge area. And of course, these um, materials are very interesting, for example, for thermal insulation, but also for example, for water filtration due to the high um, surface area. And another very interesting property of cellulose are um, the strong and specific water interactions. For material science, which can, this can be an advantage. For example, we can use this property to produce humidity sensors. We can also make um, shape morphing materials, for example, uh, materials which change their shape up on um, different wetting conditions or different humidity levels. But if you think about cellulose um, chemistry, as more of a chemistry, then of course it's rather a challenge because usually in chemistry you want to get rid of water. So most chemical reactions um, are most efficient without water. So this is, of, this is of course a challenge and I will explain you later on how we can overcome this. In my talk, I want to talk uh, first about um, how we can kind of control the shape of nanocellulosis and also later on more about different chemical concepts to modify um, cellulose in a very sustainable manner. And here, or in both cases, water interactions play an important role. And I will explain to you later why this is the case. So first of all, um, let's think about the structure and the shape of cellulose. So we all know that the cellulose fiber is an hierarchical structure. So we have a big fiber. It's composed of individual microfibril bundles, individual microfibrils, and these microfibrils are again composed of polymer chains. And how can we now obtain a nanocellulose or colloids? Um, one very easy way is mechanical treatment. Um, if we fibrillate the fiber, we obtain cellulose nanofibers. And in principle, this is a top-down approach. So we start from the big fiber and go below in a smaller scale to the nanofibers. Similar nanocrystals are obtained, for example, by acidic, acidic treatment. Um, also a top-down approach. And this is very different to normal polymer chemistry. Usually uh, polymer chemistry and materials from made of polymers are um, fabricated by bottom up. So meaning that you start from a monomer, you polymerize, and then you shape this polymer into a certain shape. Um, so now the question arises, so we, since we are kind of limited with the shape and morphology, like we have nanofibers, nanocrystals, both are rather higher aspect ratio colloids, so how can we make cellulose nanospheres? And also here, how can we make these in a sustainable manner? The polymer chemist probably would say this is very easy. Uh, let's just dissolve it and just nanoprecipitate them. And then we get these very nice uh, nanospheres. But for cellulose, this is rather challenging because um, 
cellulose is non-soluble and it's very difficult to dissolve cellulose. So we need harsh conditions, hazardous solvent. So um, maybe there's a different way. And in fact, let's think back. So I showed you the nanofibers, for example, if we now combine a chemical treatment um, and a fibrillation, for example, tempo oxidation, then we can really um, disintegrate individual microfibrils. Similar for if we have a cellulose two material, we can do the same. So we can kind of reveal the building block of a cellulose two. In this case, the cellulose two material is obtained um, as byproduct in the textile fabrication. And so it's very interesting to use it. It's kind of a waste uh, byproduct. So what happens now if you introduce charge onto this material? So here, this is not the tempo oxidation. It's a carboxymethylation. It's in principle very similar. So we introduce a repulsive charge. And of course, if you, if you have a hierarchical structure, what happens if you introduce a repulsive charge? You will weaken the interparticle interactions. So now what happens if you shear this, um, this material after modification, we can get these spherical nanoparticles. And um, there are already some, some, in principle, some papers about that. Some you can also make them or obtain them, for example, by acidic hydrolysis. But if you use this approach, in this case, the carboxymethylation, um, you won't affect in any manner crystallinity and uh, molar mass, and thereby you can really preserve the structure, like the building block structure of the cellulose too. And so what we believe, and we have also quite um, good proof of that, is that these um, nanoparticles have a very particular structure. So they're rather like a core shell um, particle. And so we have a more crystalline core and an amorphous soft outer shell structure. Thereby, of course, if you have an amorphous shell, this is accessible. So um, this is, for example, very interesting for sorption related processes. And, and these particles have also like a soft particle characteristic and can be therefore classified as a new type of nanocellulose, a cellulose collide, um, soft nanospheres. And so now what can we do with this? So I told you we have this accessible particle shell. So sorption related processes would probably benefit from them because we add, can absorb much more than on a, for example, crystalline, um, or like rubber crystal and nanofiber or nanocrystal. Um, so that's why we tested these surfaces um, in protein sorption. So we absorbed in this case a model protein, albumin, um, and compared this to conventional use coatings and just a normal polymer coating um, of a soluble polymer. In this case, we use cationized starch, but you can get very similar results also with chitosan and so on. Our idea was just to show that with these nanospheres, we can absorb much higher quantities to, for example, nanofibers, but also to polymer coated nanofibers. And so here we can see the results. So on the left side, you can see QCND results. Um, you can see the delta frequency, the frequency shape change up on absorption. Um, the orange curve is the surface coated with these nanospheres and the gray curve is the surface coated with this, with this uh, soluble polymer coating. And we can see that if we now analyze this data, uh, we can see that we can absorb three times the amount of albumin on these nanosphere surfaces. So this is of course very interesting because now we can just, we can achieve a much higher density on these um, on these layers, for example. And therefore, it is a very promising uh, approach to, for example, absorb proteins, which we need, for example, in immunoassays. And on the left side, you can see now um, kind of a scaled up experiment. Um, in the previous slide, I showed you QCMD results. So we have a very small model surface. Here, we really have a paper substrate. So on the one hand, on the upper, the upper figure, we coated the paper substrate with a soluble uh, polymer, which is usually used in such coatings. And in below, we compared this with this nanosphere coating. In this case, we didn't absorb album, albumin, we absorbed immunoglobulin, which is um, much more important and also used in antigen tests. And we can see that here as well, we can, in, we can absorb much, much higher quantities. And this could potentially, um, in future antigen tests, also increase the sensitivity. Um, we got also very um, nice 
news. So our work was also featured on the December issue of uh, Small. So very happy for that. And, and thanks go as well to Katerina Solin, who is the first author of this paper. Um, so next, so I told, I kind of introduced a new shaped nanocellulose to you, soft nanospheres. So next I would like to show you how we can optimize or how, how we can make conventional cellulose um, reactions, which are conducted or well and um, frequently and, and are well known in a more, in a much more sustainable manner. And I will show this in the example of a pyruvate oxidation. Um, in fact, the pyruvate oxidation is a very appealing avenue to functional cellulose because it's very powerful. It's weaker selective. So what does this mean? It means that it only attacks selectively the C2 OH and the 3 OH. And it also works in aqueous conditions. Actually, you need water. Without water, you would not form the aldehyde groups. So, um, and then we have finally cellulose modified with aldehyde groups, the aldehyde cellulose, and this is very reactive and we can use it, for example, to obtain by oxidation carboxylated uh, cellulose nanofibers. We can also obtain sulfonated nanofiber uh, upon reaction with bisulfide, but we can also introduce any amine reactants, for example, to make uh, nanofibers more hydrophobic, to introduce cationic charge, and also to immobilize proteins. So, um, in principle, we can also use this to make nanocellulosis. Uh, recently, it was shown that this can be the period oxidation conducted in a selective manner, it can be used to produce rod like nanocrystals from um, raw biomasses. And we also can make these hairy nanocrystals. In fact, these um, have also rather particular structures. So we have a crystalline rod and then tangling a uh, change at the end groups of this of his um, bots and but what is what is the drawback of a pyruvate oxidation? The drawback are the conditions or the conventionally used reaction conditions. So for example, most papers um, use the, or in most work in most works, pyruvate oxidation is conducted at low solid content, for example, one weight percent, meaning that if we want to modify one kilogram of cellulose, we need hundred liters of water. And this is not including washing step. Of course, we need much, much, much higher quantities. And then also kin kinetics are not so fast. So usually we have to do period oxidation over days and we need also elevated temperature. So we need to heat it. So we need constant energy input to, um, to oxidize the cellulose. And of course, this is not so sustainable and there's still a lot of room for optimization. Um, so what we tried was to conduct period oxidation at high consistency. So we increased the solid content from one weight percent to 20 weight percent, whereby of course we reduced the amount of water necessary from 100 liters to five liters per kilogram. In principle, also the washing is more efficient so we can also save their water in the washing steps. And um, what is very interesting in this case is that we just need two minutes of mixing. Um, in this paper, we used uh, ball milling as a mixing technique, um, but in principle, we can use also a kneader. So this is this can be, or in, in lab, lab scale, also a glass rod. So we just need to, to make sure that we have a homogeneous mixture and later on we just the oxidation just, um, just, of course spontaneously and kind of so we don't need any energy later on so therefore it's very resource efficient um ariana um, did the experimental work of this in this paper and she did also design of experiment and now we have this very nicely optimized model where we can up depending on the reaction time from one hour to eight hours you can get very different aldehyde content. So you can just even to get the aldehyde content which you need for your reaction. Um, yes, all right. So whereby we kind of, oh, we, into, we made this the period oxidation, which is in fact a very powerful method, much more resource efficient. And we, we are convinced that this is very important. For example, if you want to go to the next step to go into industrial scale. Um, all right, so here we can see in principle that 
the aldehyde contents we just showed you by our approach, we can vary from two to eight minimal per gram. In fact, in these cases, we already are the period oxidation. It's not only modifying the surface. It, it can be under very special condition, but usually it also proceeds into crystalline regions. And for the period oxidation, it's completely fine if we want to have a sample with a high oxidation degree. But if we want to, for example, hydrophobize uh, nanofibers or nanocrystals, we don't want to change uh, the crystallinity because the crystallinity and also molar mass are the reasons why, um, why we can make like, we can use these um, colloids, for example, in reinforcing um, of deep, or in reinforcing of materials and so on. So if we reduce crystallinity or molar mass, we will also reduce the mechanical performance of our final product. And this was already shown like a long, long time ago, um, 1943. Here, what they did, they, um, they acetylated cotton um, with, usually with very low degree of substitutions. And then they measured or they showed the depend dependency of the degree of substitution and the tensile strength. Interestingly, we can see that we have an optimal reason, region. So if we go, roughly uh, above the degree of substitution of 0.2, we will reduce the tensor strength. And um, meaning that it's very important to kind of confine chemistry on the surface of cellulose. And because if we go beyond this, we will in fact reduce mechanical performance. Um, so here we introduced um, a new chemical concept, um, which enables the esterification aqueous media. And this, this reactions is also only mo modifies the surface of a cellulose fiber. So it's a heterogeneous um, modification. Um, so if you think about esterification or acetylation, usually what you need to do is a solvent exchange or drying. And why do you need that? Because um, if you use acetic anhydride, you have a chemical which is sensitive to water. So if you have water, it will react with the anhydride and it will reduce the efficiency of the reactions. Um, so, and of course, if you want to solvent exchange, we need a lot of quantity of organic solvent. And if you try, the shrinkage occurs and also due to the um, high specific surface area of cellulose and nanocellulosis, we will um, form irreversible hydrogen bonds upon trying. So things which we really want to avoid. And that's why we um, developed this novel approach. So it's embed esterification. It's based on the reaction of acetylimidazole. So we can, acetylimidazole in this case, dissolve in DMS or and directly, um, um, it's directly mixed with nevertheless fibers. So we have a high amount of water in these reactions um, and thereby we can surface acetylate nanocellulose or cellulose. So we can see this of a successful introduction of these acetyl groups also in the IR spectrum. Um, furthermore, we can see that these reactions, um, in principle, you need to mix, you need to homogeneously introduce this acetylimidazole and then just wait. So you don't need to steer it or to heat it. So it's just a matter of diffusion and time. Um, I'm not including this because for limited time, but we showed that these conditions only um, modify surface of the microfibrils of the cellulose, in fact. So it's a very mild and water tol tolerant um, reaction. Um, it can be due because it's very simple. Uh, it can be easily upscaled. So it would be very interesting for industrial um, realization. And you can also control the degree of substitution up to the S of 0.2. And if you think that like on the slide, which I showed you before, this is in the region of an optimal DS range. Um, of course, we can now, if you have an acetyl fiber, we can produce also nanofibers. In fact, acetylation increases with fibrillation tendency. So we can get um, nanofibers with a, with a smaller width. And of course, nanopapers produced from these have also hydrophobic properties or more hydrophobic properties than native nanocellulose. Um, so now, this is the latest work. Uh, I cannot show you uh, much more details about that. Uh, we managed also to establish a protocol for rigorous selective um, esterification. So thereby we can selectively introduce chemical functionalities on the primary hydroxy groups. 
This is very similar to tempo oxidation, but we have, um, we can of course introduce any, any function groups we can think about. And therefore, for example, Taylor surface energy. And also in this case, um, this is on contrast, for example, to peridate and tempo oxidation, we can really preserve crystallinity and molar mass. And I believe that we can thereby overcome current benchmarks, for example, in mechanical performance, but we will see this in the future. And I hope I can tell you about this in more in the next meeting. Um, to conclude my talk, um, I showed you that we have a new class of nanocellulose. These soft nanospheres are especially promising as high performance sorption materials and could be, for example, increased sensitivity of next generation immunoassays. Then I showed you um, that we have also new tools in cellulose chemistry. We can conduct period oxidation at high consistency to make it much more resource efficient. Um, we have a wet esterification, which enables us to modify, introduce um, acetyl groups, hydrophobic groups on cellulose without drying, without removal of water. And later on, we have a selectively tailored nanofibers, which, um, which will allow us to, to, in principle, bring any desirable group selectively on the primary group of a cellulose fiber. Um, lastly, I would like to acknowledge, of course, um, all collaborators and uh, sup my supervisors at BOCO and also Alto University. And of course, thank you all for your kind attention and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for sharing your work. Very inspiring. The audience is demanding answers <laughs> and there are questions for you so firstly um, can you elaborate on the recycling during periodate oxidation associated costs and environmental impact um yes also so they are so this was also done in our lab so there are methods to recycle periodate for example you can use ozone um, so this is possible it's still um, challenging to implement into a process but um I, I think it's just a matter of time. So it's possible to recycle and then by, by we, it's also to make it more sustainable. Okay. Uh, then there is a question on the adsorption experiment on the slide number six. Uh, what is the specific surface area for the respective films? Um, and do you think that that can be the reason for the different amounts that were adsorbed? Um. So yeah. the surface area. Mm. That's a good, <laughs> how, how to define the surface area of this model surface. So in principle, maybe to tell you a little bit more. Um, so we use the model surface. So these are cellulose nanofibers. So on their own, they have already high specific surface area. The polymer coating enables more or less uh, adsorption of the monolayer. So we will preserve um, this high surface area of, um, of the nanofibers. And um, of course, in principle, we, through the nanospheres, we um, increase the accessible surface area. So we believe that, um, for example, if you if you think about polymer coated uh, nanofibers, proteins can only absorb at the surface of such. But in the nanospheres, we believe the reason is that we kind of have a nano gel, so polymers or proteins can absorb on the surface, but also co can penetrate this. Mm. Yeah, and we actually for QCMT we may, we realized that we have kind of a cross-linking effect. So if we if we introduce a protein, the the rheology of a layer um, or shear moduli increase. So this is uh, kind of strengthening this idea that it goes into the layer. Mm. Have you determined here the amounts of water in the layers, or is that something interesting? Um, I think we have, but I have to look into this in more detail, to be honest. But we, uh, so these um, mass adsorption, these are already um, from model data. So we don't just, we didn't calculate simply frequency into mass. So this is already taking into account uh, in a certain, to a certain degree water in the layer. Thank you, Marco. There are a couple of more questions, but I hope that you will get them after this talk because we okay. will need to move on. So thank you. Sure. Thank you as well. Bye-bye.